And welcome to another episode of the Elixir Mix podcast. This week on our panel, we have Josh Adams. Howdy. Eric Berry. Hello, my friends. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. And this week, we're talking to Osa Gaius. Hey there. Do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Osa. I'm a software engineer at a company called MailChimp in Atlanta. Uh, originally from Nigeria, grew up in Miami, and I've uh, been riding Elixir for a couple of years now. Very cool. Uh, I have a friend from the Angular community, and his his joke was that um, I think two or three of the World Cup teams for the, the European teams, I think France and England, he said he said that those were both African teams because so many of the players were from Nigeria. So that's that's the goal. Uh, we're <laughs> continuing the mission. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> it's hilarious. I, I don't keep up with soccer anymore, but growing up, that was always that was the sport to to follow back in Nigeria. Yep. Definitely. Well, we brought you on because you gave a talk at Elixir Days uh, 2018 about why Elixir matters. And it was really interesting just kind of digging into this and getting... It, it wasn't just, oh, this is why Elixir's cool, but you went into the history of functional programming and where some of the concepts in Elixir came from. And I was wondering if you just wanted to kind of get us started there and explain a little bit of the uh, heritage that Elixir has and where all that comes from and why that matters. And then we can kind of go from there. Yeah, so great question. Um, so for, for me, the idea for the talk, you know, started a couple of years ago while I was writing Elixir professionally and, and sort of working the language every day and sort of thinking, well, you know, how, how did I end up writing Elixir? You know, how did this language come to be? I had done some closure in the past as well for about a year. And so I sort of found similar themes in both Clojure as well as Elixir, and sort of got curious about, well, how did this actually come to exist? And so talked to some friends last year at MailChimp, and we were sort of interested in, well, how exactly is it that these functional languages seem to become popular for a year or two, maybe a couple of years, and then slowly sort of decline and never reach the same status as, let's say, JavaScript or, or Java? Um, and so when I, when I started thinking about that, there were some languages that stood out to me, right? There were Obviously, Clojure, but then Clojure is a Lisp, so Lisp in the first place. Uh, languages like Smalltalk, sort of classic languages that people look back to. And then I started sort of evaluating, well, how do I kind of trace these languages, you know, back to the present moment? And the best way for me that I found was to start with, you know, the original sort of Lambda calculus uh, as a mathematical notation, and then work slowly up, you know, to the present moment. And so the talk kind of walks, you know, from Lambda calculus uh, in the 1930s, all the way up to Elixir today. Um, and, and my process was very, you know, historical there in terms of looking at each language and looking at what those languages shared in common. Awesome. Now, uh, have we talked about uh, Lambda Calculus on the show before, Josh and Eric? Not, Not in depth, for sure. So, Because I think that might be an interesting place to start, and then we can kind of work our way up to how we wound up with something like Elixir. Cool. Um, so one, one sort of caveat that, that I would kind of mention is that my, my approach to thinking about pro functional languages or languages generally uh, is, is a bit different. I tend not to look at them as, you know, competing in terms of, you know, features, because I think language features at this point are, are pretty, pretty standard across the boat. I think what makes them different uh, or what makes discussions about them different is, is sort of the social and political context in which they're, they're framed. Um, so I think Lambda Calculus is an interesting sort of development because it emerges in the 1930s um, out of the work that Alonzo Church was doing around, you know, mathematical, mathematical research. Mathematical research. Um, and for him, Lambda Calculus was just a, a sort of an approach to logic or mathematical logic. And it was a way that you could actually describe, you know, computations um, just by using pure functions, right? Um, there were some ideas around variable binding and substitution built into Lambda Calculus, but it was mostly just a model of computation um, based on logic that could be used to build something complex like a Turing machine. And Lambda Calculus is, is very interesting because it then becomes the basis for uh, a series of other languages, most notably, you know, Lisp, et cetera. But all functional languages have their root uh, in, in Lambda Calculus. Very cool. At the beginning of the show, I said, 
I'm going to be able to understand all of this. And just so you know, I'm out. I mean, <laughs> 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 so I'm going to mute and wait until I can provide some valuable info. But for those people, <laughs> can you like dumb that down just a little bit more? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think the important thing to not, I actually got into this boat where I spent about like three weeks teaching myself Lambda calculus. And then I realized, well, uh, the important thing about functional programming and why Elixir matters is to some level, you don't have to understand Lambda calculus, right? It's, it's like really heady, really extremely difficult mathematics. Um, but the, the basis of Lambda calculus is that you, you can take any sort of complex computation that you want to perform and you can reduce it down to simple pure functions that you can then, uh, you know, take input and output. And then once you're done composing those functions, the, the results of that will be, you know, some operation that you want to perform, right? Or some instruction to the computer. Um, so Lambda Calculus was a way that Alonzo Church was trying to argue or at least propose we build complex machines like the Turing machine, right? Um, Got it. But I would say don't get caught up on the, whenever, you know, for those listening, whenever you start working uh, in functional programming, it's very easy to get pulled into Lambda Calculus as this like holy grail. But it's important to recognize that it's the basis for what we do, but it's not the majority of the work we do with functional programming languages. Yeah, for, for me, so Lambda Calculus is a mathematical construct that, that, like you said, is the basis for a lot of these machines. And I haven't looked into or thought about this stuff for quite a long time, but it essentially allows you to prove mathematically a lot of the concepts that go into the programming language. Whereas with uh, some of the other paradigms, you know, with some of the procedural or object-oriented uh, paradigms, it's much more theoretical and much less provable. And it, it gets really interesting then, um, the concepts that have to go into a functional language in order to make it purely functional and therefore mathematically sound. But because of that, a lot of the simplicity that we get from functional languages come out of the ideas that come from Lambda Calculus. And, and that's the payoff. Precisely, precisely. So if you think of like ideas like, you know, monads and punctoids, et cetera, that, uh, you know, are, are for the brave, um, it's important to know that those ideas actually trace back to the early work on Lambda calculus. And they're not, um, they're not new ideas, which I think is the important part of tracing the history of functional programming. It's, it's actually ex extremely old um, and extremely theoretical and based in like hardcore computer science. It's not just sort of a modern fad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my favorite talks, um, kind of tying some of this together, it was at RubyConf and it was Jim Weirich and he gave a talk about the Y Combinator and he basically uh, built and proved the Y Combinator in Ruby. Wow. And, it's one of, one of the best talks ever. Yeah, and so if you're, if you're trying to get your head around, you know, what all this really means, um, walking through that talk, it's extremely approachable, but at the same time, it also gives you an idea of when we're talking about uh, purely functional programming, uh, just what exactly we're dealing with and how the math actually affects the way that the, pro the programming works. So, so how do we get to some of the high level stuff then that we're doing with Elixir? I mean, it's, it's not like the straight line between <laughs> Lambda calculus and Elixir with all of the really awesome stuff that we build in it these days. And some of the stuff, I don't know exactly how it ties back to Lambda calculus or if it does. Good point. Good point. So I think the, the way I sort of think about it is Lambda Calculus uh, is sort of the start of the early work um, in functional programming. So it's sort of very mathematical at this point, very research driven. And then in the 50s, uh, particularly in the mid to late 50s, we see uh, something called Lisp uh, or the Lisp programming language invented by John McCarthy. And Lisp was not uh, truly based on Lambda Calculus. Uh, there are actually some, some, some flaws in its approach. Uh, but it was the first attempt to take Lambda Calculus and then build a high-level programming language that could be used for actual programming work, right? Um, and following the 1950s, we then see in the 70s, as well as in the 80s, a period that I call, you know, making functional programming practical. And, and th in that period, we see the emergence of things like Scheme, languages like ML, languages like Erlang. They were all taking these early ideas from Lisp, uh, as well as from Lambda Calculus around building correct programming languages, you know, things... Uh, uh, things like anonymous functions or lambdas that we're used to today, things like pure functions, and you know, languages like ML, Erlang, Haskell, etc., all sort of emerge in the 80s, 70s, uh, and then up to the, the, the mid-90s as sort of attempts to make these ideas practical for use. 
Um, but it's not until the, the 1990s as well as the early 2000s that we start to see languages like Scala, uh, F-sharp, Clojure, and Elixir begin to take, you know, what are, I think, very early attempts to make functional programming, pra functional programming practical and then make them more useful for, I think, uh, modern programming work in industry. Uh, and Elixir is sort of one of the, you know, the new developments that borrows heavily from, from you know, the classic programming styles that Lisp, Haskell, uh, and languages like Erlang emerged. Elixir is, in particular is based on Erlang. So it's, a, it's built on the Erlang VM and in many ways borrows from the Erlang language. Um, but in many ways, it, it, you know, I think it's interesting because it's one of the modern languages that, in many, you know, in, in a large sense, does not require you to understand anything about lambda calculus, but you get, you know, many of the core tenets like, you know, pure functions uh, by default or pure functions um, by convention. All of these sort of ideas are brought into Elixir without you having to understand very deeply, you know, what a functoid is, what a monad is. So is it just a level of abstraction then over the top of the uh, lambda calculus or... You know, are, are there other constructs that are thrown into the mix that make Elixir and, and languages like it more approachable? Yeah, I think there are a couple of things. I think one is that Elixir is very much driven by, you know, the Ruby community's focus on on building approachable languages, languages that people can easily get into. Um, so that's what's sort of one main difference between Elixir and other functional languages. For one, I think the second is that it's built on the Erlang virtual machine, which uh, brings into the, into play a bunch of ideas around concurrency and how to do concurrent programming, uh, particularly in a, in a distributed system. So I think those two ideas, right, both approachable, you know, programming languages as well as you know distributed programming, sort of make Elixir different. Um, but at the very core, it is mostly just about you know taking data, manipulating data using pure functions. Um, I think that's the heart of Elixir that ties it back to you know Lisp, ties it back to Lambda calculus. In your research, as you were going through this, did you kind of get a sense of, of man, almost an organic growth where it seems like, you know, if everything started back with Lambda calculus back in the 30s, as you're researching this, do you feel like it's almost like you're passing on from one person to another, like a little bit of knowledge and they augment it and then it goes on a little bit more and they augment it and and it kind of, do you, I don't really know how to explain this, but do you feel like you're, you're viewing something organic and beautiful as it, as it grows? That's a great point, actually. And, and that's one of the terms that I, I use in the talk that I think is a bit different than other talks is, is this idea of genealogy, right? And genealogy really is about tracing a family history over time, right? And seeing the ways in which ideas get passed down, get changed, get morphed, et cetera. And I think that's very evident in functional programming. So for instance, you see this idea of pattern matching, right? This idea that you can match against the arguments uh, passed into a function, uh, either in the function head or within the function itself. And that's something that we see in Elixir and we take for granted in Elixir, but it's really a very old idea um, that, that actually, you know, we can trace back uh, all the way to the very early uh, functional languages that, that sort of emerge, right? Languages like ML in 1973 already have these ideas around pattern matching built in. And, you know, so those ideas we now take for granted in, in, in modern languages like Elixir that are functional, but these are ideas that have just sort of been passed on, they've evolved, they've changed in many ways, um, but they're still the sort of core ideas that develop. Um, and I think things like static typing uh, or even, you know, uh, lazy evaluation emerge very, very early, you know, in Miranda, uh, in ML, but then also get passed on all the way down to closure, all the way down to Elixir. I think it's interesting too that you bring up ML because we're seeing sort of a resurgent in ML languages as well. Uh, the, the one that comes to mind for me is Reason, which is the one that uh, Facebook has been putting together for the React community. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, I sort of categorize this, you know, new development of, of, and I think of them as languages built on languages, right? Um, and I think reason is interesting, you know, in, in addition to things like closure script, et cetera, mm -hmm. because there are attempts to take these very like interesting ideas around, you know, safety, uh, around, you know, resiliency of programs and apply them to the front end, uh, which for a long time has been sort of, you know, thought of as an afterthought, right? Like we, we in many ways require resiliency and safety from our backend systems, 
uh, or you know, business critical systems. But the front end, as it grows more important, requires these sort of same ideas. So I think it's interesting to see you know, languages like Elm, et cetera, develop that are very focused on, well, how do we broaden the places in which we can uh, guarantee safety of programs? Based on your research, if you were to like, you know, back to the gene- genealogy thing, I know like you can send your DNA out and they'll send you back and say, hey, you're 20% this and 40% this and maybe 15% this. And like, there's an outlier of like 1.5%. Like there was a recent South Park episode about that exact thing, right? But if you were to break it down in a very rough scale and say, okay, well, the genealogy, like the the history of Elixir is X percent of this, X percent of that. Um, and that's what makes Elixir. How would you break that down? Deploy more, pay less with DigitalOcean, the simplest all-in-one cloud computing platform for developers. Scale and run cloud applications faster and more efficiently with effortless administration tools to robust compute flexible configurations, networking services, real-time alerts, and rapid provisioning while enjoying industry-leading price to performance with a flat pricing structure across all global data center regions at any usage volume. Spend more time building better web apps and less time worrying about managing infrastructure with DigitalOcean. Build your next app on DigitalOcean. Get started with a free $100 credit at do.co slash elixir. I would probably say that, you know, if you think of the if you think of the tree that, you know, the, the descendants of, of sort of lambda calculus, the proper descendants being, you know, let's say uh, Lisp on one hand, right? Uh, and then on the other hand being uh, sort of the, the Haskell Miranda family, right? Um, I, I think if you think of it that way, then, then you can sort of think of Elixir as borrowing from those equally. Um, but I think the other two parts of, of the Elixir sort of uh, ancestry that matter are one Ruby, right? Although Ruby is not a direct, you know, parent of Elixir, but I think the fact that Jose Valen spent many years in the Ruby community as a core contributor, uh, I think in many ways, I think 40% or so of Elixir really is Ruby, right? In terms of uh, the community, the approach to documentation, uh, even, you know, the syntax in many ways. Uh, I think that's something that's important not to miss is that Elixir is one of the few modern functional languages that actually borrows heavily from a non-functional um, or he's functional in the proper sense, right? Uh, from a non-functional language in terms of community, in terms of syntax and approach to, uh, to language development. So I think 40% Ruby, 30% Erlang, and Erlang not in the functional sense, but Erlang in terms of like its approach to concurrency and the fact that it runs on the Erlang VM. And then 30% from the rest of, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the functional community, the proper functional community. So, you know, from Lisp, we... Uh, we borrow certain ideas from closure. We borrow certain ideas, for instance, the approach to um, the approach to having immutable data structures, right? In many ways, borrows heavily from the way the closure approaches the same problem. It almost sounds like you're saying it's it's almost a nature versus nurture thing, where the nature <laughs> all of these languages it actually is where you derive it, but the nurture side of Ruby really kind of guided the the collection of these ideas and, and and solidified it in a certain way. But yeah, it's fascinating that you your talk uh, really uses the genealogy aspect, and and Chuck and I live in like genealogy USA, right, Utah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It's always interesting to like hear different analogies that follow that that pattern. Yeah, I think yeah. It's, uh, Go ahead. I was just going to say, I know, I know for me, the, the bit from Ruby, even though I, I care strongly for the, the functional programming bits, uh, the community aspect that seems to have carried over from the Ruby community and the tooling. The tooling was a big thing for me. I was doing Erlang before Elixir and uh, it just was incomparable, the sort of level of tooling uh, on the Elixir side at the time, especially. Well, and if we're talking about genealogy, right? I mean, uh, you know, here in, you know, Eric mentioned, you know, Utah, we, we both live probably 10, 15 minutes from uh, Ancestry.com's new uh, headquarters over here in Lehigh. And uh, the, the LDS or Mormon church has the largest genealogical library in the world. And we're uh, 40 minutes or so from there. So, you know, we, we do see that. But the thing that's interesting is, is that they don't just collect the, the records with birth dates and death dates and things like that. They also collect the the oral and written histories of these people. And it's similar with, you know, with what we're talking about here with uh, Ruby versus Elixir, right? Is that a lot of the things that Elixir inherited were more tradition and, you know, sort of that oral or written history and how we manage all that stuff as opposed to necessarily the 
straight up technical and syntactic things that go into the language and how it functions. And and both of those are important and both of those make up the the heritage or legacy that the language has. Well said, well said. And I, I, I make this argument in the talk and I, I tend to agree that there's a perhaps too much of an emphasis on the technical and syntactic inheritance uh, that occurs in languages, uh, almost to the detriment of the tradition and, and the political and social context that, that do inform it, right? So, you know, you take a language like Scala that in many ways inherits a great deal from Java. And so you think, well, it's clear that Scala should supplant Java because it's functional and it's on the JVM and it looks like Java in many ways, uh, but it does not and has not yet supplanted Java. I think that's because there is a great deal of importance when it comes to tradition that um, we often take for granted. Yeah. So to, to get to kind of the heart of this discussion, then we, we've talked about, about Elixir and its history and heritage and where it comes from, but why Elixir? Why, why does it matter? I mean, that that's the, the, the core of your talk, right? Why Elixir matters. So, you know, given all this history, you know, why do we need an Elixir? You know, why, why aren't some of these other systems or languages, be it Clojure or Ruby or whatever, you know, why isn't that just a good stopping place, I guess, for, for technology? That's a good point. So I was actually, I've been thinking about this exact question because every time I give a talk, I, I get new questions sort of asked, right? You know, different versions of the same question. Well, okay, you've done this historical work, but still, why Elixir, right? Why, uh, why not Erlang even, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think there, there's a quote from Joe Armstrong that I referenced, Joe Armstrong, the founder of Erlang, uh, where he mentions that, you know, in the 21st century, there are a host of problems that businesses are, are coming to, to terms with, which essentially boil down to the fact that, uh, you know, we, we've reached in many ways the zenith of Moore's law. Uh, the, the speed of computation uh, is not going to increase at a dramatic pace anymore. And so we have to rethink whether or not our approach to computation is the correct one, right? Uh, most notably, this just means that we have to do more with the computers we have, right? Um, one way to approach this is to think about concurrent, you know, programs. But the second way to think about this as well, uh, how can we guarantee the reliability of the systems we're building um, so that we can have you know less less of a need for redundancy, et cetera, and just essentially get more out of the tools we have today. Uh, and his argument is that Erlang uh, is, is sort of the key way to solve this because Erlang has, in many ways, resolved a lot of issues around concurrency, around reliability, around redundancy that we today are are, are grappling with. Um, and so I think my argument is that that is in many ways true. I think the actor model that Akka and Erlang and even Norleans to some level will bring up uh, or bring some of the fore foreground, that actor model is really useful because it allows for us to think about building systems in a very, very reliable way from the ground up. It gives us the primitives necessary to do that, the primitives to deal with failure, uh, to deal with you know crashes, et cetera, in a real way. And it also gives us primitives around scaling systems uh, from, from being a single node to multiple nodes or from being a single process to multiple processes. However, the challenge is, uh, in many ways, there are some usability concerns uh, with the Erlang language that are primarily down to the fact that most people find the syntax difficult to understand and the tooling uh, somewhat lacking, right? And so I think for that reason, Elixir is particularly unique because it essentially takes the Erlang virtual machine and provides these very unique ideas uh, and very battle-tested ideas, you know, from Ericsson uh, starting in the, in the 80s. It takes these ideas and, and then repackages them and provides unique tooling, a great community. Uh, so in many ways, it's, it's interesting to think of Elixir as syntactic sugar uh, on the Erlang virtual machine or syntactic sugar around distributed and concurrent programming, which is very, very valuable because in a modern age, the problems where we need to solve, particularly to make our businesses you know, grow, involve solving distribution and solving concurrency. Yeah, for me, one of the things that Elixir provides in terms of usability over Erlang is uh, sort of accessible macros. Um, I don't know if you've done any parse transforms in Erlang, but it's just not something people reach for um, because it's it's very complicated and you have to know like three different versions of the AST depending on what you're wanting to do. And it's just not what it's like to write a macro in Elixir. Of course, you should write a few of them. But yeah, I, th I think that there's this whole like power of the Erlang, uh, sort of in Erlang that most people don't access because parse transforms are really hard. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree there. I think, 
you know, macros are one thing. Uh, even, you know, basic ideas around going from one node to multiple nodes uh, is something that I think the Elixir community just provides really good tooling around, um, you know, for something like computing <clears throat> PubSub, gives you, you know, globally distributed messaging across multiple nodes. It's something that you can, you can put together uh, in Erlang, but will take you some time, right? Uh, and you'll have to reinvent the wheel on many things. I think the Elixir community in many ways takes the same approach that, that Rails and Ruby does in terms of like, there should be a gem for what you need to do. And the gem should be reliable and in many ways stable. And the community should support that gem such that when a business has a particular problem, you can reach for the gem as opposed to having to build the things from scratch. And I think because Erlang and for you know, many, many decades was uh, for, for one, restricted to Ericsson in terms of not being open source. And then even after being open sourced uh, was, was actually banned at Ericsson for quite some time. Uh, one of the things to note about that is that significantly limited the ability for for us to, you know, have access to the kind of tooling that people have internally with Ericsson or have the kind of language development that, that you know, Ruby has has seen. I think Elixir takes a fresh look at that and says, well, here are the things that matter from Erlang and then here's how we can surface them, build tooling around them, and then make them accessible to the, the rest of the community. So what gets you excited now besides Elixir? Are you, I mean, I, I imagine that you seem the type to me that really enjoys learning new languages. So what's on your mind now aside from Elixir? Hmm. So of recent, I think, you know, two things. I think one, you know, I, in Atlanta, I run the Elixir meetup. Um, and so one of my focus areas recently has been, well, you know, Elixir is great. Uh, functional programming languages are great. Um, but what's even harder is how do we get people who, uh, or other underrepresented, you know, uh, whatever that may be, didn't attend a computer science program in undergrad or, you know, or, or from a, a group that doesn't have access to computer science education, right? How do we get those folks into functional programming, right? Uh, because if we take Joe Armstrong's precept correctly, which is that the hard problems of the 21st century uh, that businesses need to solve will have to be solved by understanding, at the very least, concurrent programming, right? How do we get folks to understand that and to, to be in that community? Because in many ways, that is what will ensure that those folks have you know, opportunities in terms of jobs, but also good jobs uh, going forward. So that's been on my mind lately, is how do we get those underrepresented folks into uh, the communities that are discussing functional programming or discussing concurrent programming? Um, and so one thing we've done is reach out to lots of groups like Women Who Code that are in Atlanta and make sure that we have people coming to the meetups that uh, otherwise wouldn't come to the meetups, um, you know, making sure that they have access to conferences, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the second area that's been on my mind as well, you know, functional programming is great and, and it's amazing. And it's honestly one of the best things that I've learned uh, in the last couple of years. But how do we make sure that the actual problems that businesses are trying to solve can be easily translated to functional programming concepts, right? So, you know, you take the classic case, well, I need to build an enterprise service bus, right? Classic problem. That often doesn't really translate well if you do a Google search for enterprise service bus functional programming. Like you don't get like a bunch of results, like there aren't a bunch of talks about that. Um, so I think that's actually very important is for us to begin to take these ideas that people are thinking about and trying to solve for their companies every day and then start looking for ways that functional programming can be the first, if not the best tool to reach for when trying to solve that problem. Uh, that makes sense. So you you're not you're very much functional, and uh, in your mind, the object object uh, based programming or object oriented programming is not necessarily a uh, not necessarily the right direction in the future. I so I I I hesitate to say it's not the right direction. I mean, to be fair, object oriented programming has been the majority of the last what three to four decades. Um, so it works, right? I think that's important to recognize that it works. Um, and it, many of the systems we rely on today are, are built on that. Uh, but I think in terms of how do we move forward, I think we need an answer to concurrency. We need a, a stable concurrent program model. I think Go is, is one attempt to solve that that isn't functional um, or by, by default functional. So I think the question really is, you know, what is, what is the best approach to programming? Uh, and I think for a long time, that might have been uh, sort of a classic object-oriented style. But if we go back to a language like Smalltalk that is object-oriented by nature, 
we see that you know what people think of as objects today are really just things that can send messages to each other, um, which really is what functional programming is at, at default. So I think in reality, true object-oriented programming is just functional programming. Uh, but when you rip out some of the messaging uh, from object-oriented programming, what you really get, I think, is very uh, lackluster model of programming that, that that may not suit us in the future. Yeah, I feel like Alan Kay has very publicly sort of agreed with you on that. <laughs> um, to be fair, I, I'm still in Alan Kay's idea there, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think object-oriented programming in many ways has been, you know, has has deviated from its original, you know, ideation. And, and so I think what we'll have to do in the next 10, 20 years, if we want uh, object-oriented languages to continue to be useful, is for them to borrow many of the functional ideas uh, if not sort of merge wholeheartedly with, with functional programming. Yeah, and I still just want us to get over object-oriented programming, at least in its, in its current state. I mean, it definitely is not, uh, yeah, it doesn't resemble small talk presently for the most part. So um, I don't, I used to be a huge OO proponent <laughs> and like I subscribed to the ideology completely. Hmm. And uh, I just, I just don't anymore. Um, since since getting heavily into functional programming, I'm I'm much more effective, and I don't paint myself into a corner anymore. So mm. I feel like that's a lesson that could be shared more. But it's it's really hard. Like you know, you don't OO languages. You don't end up painting yourself into a corner until you're in kind of a more advanced use case. At which point, it's really hard to show somebody trivially, "Hey, here's a thing this helps you with." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I think it's which sort of brings me back to my earlier point, right about the need to to demonstrate to people uh, in very real ways um, the ways in which functional programming can resolve many of these corners that you paint yourself into. There's a great uh, series of articles um, about, you know, sort of taking the gang of four, the classic patterns, and then translating those to functional languages. And what you find is that in a functional language like Clojure or even Elixir, you don't need these sort of esoteric patterns uh, that are very complex to understand for someone just writing software every day, right? You don't need these complex patterns because the languages themselves allow us to describe very hard problems in simple ways. And I think the danger with many OO practices today uh, that don't leverage any functional concepts is that uh, they they create, you know, a great deal of uh, incidental complexity uh, to deal with complexity. And so you sort of have complexity uh, on top of complexity, which makes it hard for people who are writing software, but also hard for people uh, who are, you know, managing and deploying services in production because things are going to break. And now you have to determine, uh, did, did my original thinking about the problem change or was my thinking about the problem too complex? Or was my program model too complex such that I broke things accidentally as opposed to actually seeing a real failure? Are you speaking at any of the uh, upcoming conferences? I'm not. So I, I spoke at, uh, what, five? I had like five or six conferences earlier this year. So um, I'm actually taking a page from Dan Abramov's book, which is uh, my focus now is on, at least for the rest of the year, getting other folks to conferences, supporting other folks who are trying to speak. Um, there's only so much speaking one person can do. And I think, you know, I've, I've spoken my, my piece about why Elixir matters. And now it's up to other folks to kind of give talks. And, and um, perhaps next year I'll do some speaking, but, but my my focus right now is on like community building and learning, learning some new concepts myself. Is, does, uh, does MailChimp use Elixir? MailChimp does not use Elixir. So I was in Elixir program professionally for about two years. And then I, I changed jobs last summer. Um, and MailChimp is a PHP and Go shop. Um, so, you know, I still get to think about concurrent programming in context of Go. Um, and, you know, I can write some quasi-functional PHP, you know, pure functions all the way. Um, but no, I, I don't write Elixir professional anymore. And I don't foresee us adopting Elixir just because we're, we're at such scale that, um, and we don't have many Elixir programmers, right? So uh, it, it could be prohibitive. Um, but I, I do think that it's important for people to think about the scale at which they're at and uh, not to just adopt Elixir wholeheartedly, right? They're, you have to think through the realities of adopting a new language. It's not just, you know, swap in a new language and everything kind of. 
works right. as is. Right. So one more question that I had that I was uh, thinking about, and I kind of zoned out just kind of thinking it through in my head. Um, and I'm not sure that I or anyone really has a good answer for it, but um, you know, you mentioned all these other parts of sort of the genealogy of Elixir. And I'm wondering what kinds of things do you think Elixir is going to be the genealogy of? I mean, what hmm. what kinds of things are going to come next that Elixir is leading us into as opposed to solving problems for today? Good point. Good point. Um, I, I think there, there's sort of two classes of things. I think the first are the things that Elixir will inspire and then the things that will directly sort of descend or will borrow from Elixir. Um, I think the things that Elixir will inspire are other languages on the Beam, right? So the Beam being uh, the the Erlang virtual machine, um, or inclusive of the Erlang virtual machine, but more importantly, the runtime. Um, so if you think of, you know, the Beam as this sort of approach to distributed systems or distributed computing, uh, concurrent computing, that just sort of works out the box, right? And like includes the actor model and these sorts of things, then there are gonna be a host of things that will attempt to, in the similar way to Elixir, Elixir compiles to, uh, compiles to Erlang and, and just runs like Erlang runs. Uh, there are other things that are bit starting to emerge, right? So I have a, a friend uh, over uh, in Stockholm where of course at Klarna who's working on uh, a, a great implementation of closure on, on the beam. Uh, I have some folks, I know a friend also in Chicago who's working on, on an implementation of Elm on the beam, right? So I think these are all things that are directly inspired by Elixir and, and, and their purpose is, well, you know, there are other languages people like to write that are functional in nature. Uh, how do we write those languages and still get the benefits of a distributing concurrent, you know, platform like the Beam, like the Erlang virtual machine? So I think that's that's the first class of things that Elixir will inspire. I think the second will be things that are built on Elixir, um, things like Elixir script that, you know, is Elixir, uh, but compiles to JavaScript, right? Mm -hmm. I think those sorts of things are, are still very nascent. Uh, we haven't seen many of them yet. Uh, but I think similar to the Closure Script, what we're now seeing is people really love Closure Script and, and really adopted that language and get a lot of joy out of programming it. I, I hope that we'll see lots of things similar to, to that, uh, where people are writing Elixir but compiling Elixir to other, other languages. Cool. It'd be interesting to see how far that takes us. Indeed. Indeed. I do have one more question. Um, what, what do you see in Elixir that you would that you wish wasn't there, or what is it missing that you would like to see? Hmm. That's a good question. That's a great question, actually. Um, hmm. You wish it was object oriented, right? <laughs> uh, no, no, thank, thank, good. no, no. no. <laughs> 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 I, I don't want to browbeat object oriented programming too much. Uh, it's very useful, and I think lots of folks uh, enjoy writing software that way. Um, I, I would say that there are a couple of things. I think one is sort of theoretical, which is uh, it, it would be nice if there was a, a stronger connection to some of the functional ideas that that are really hard to understand, right? So you think of something like how does the Elixir, uh, how does Elixir implement immutable data structures, right? You know, so you think of like a crazy idea like that. Um, and how does it do it in a, in a sort of optimized way, right? That's an idea that I think once you go read the papers and you sort of go down the rabbit hole, uh, you, you know, look up HAMTs and you go down that path, like things get really like heady and really interesting. And I think my my one hope for people who come to Elixir is that a lot of these folks are coming from languages like Ruby. And so the language itself and the tooling around language and community sort of protects them from the, the really hard computer science problems. But my hope for them is that the Elixir community at some point will move them to the hard things, right? Um, I think Clojure does a good job of this by just kind of, in many ways, throwing people into their deep end, right? Uh, but my hope for Elixir is that it's very good for us to help people get into the language and get in into working in the language, but it's very important to also like show them the really hard parts. Like, well, here's how macros actually work, right? Um, so that they can begin to understand like, okay, maybe I should write a DSL. Maybe I should understand the legacy of DSLs and what I'm used for right one. Um, I, I, that's, that's sort of a, a more theoretical hope, right? It's, it's more of a hope for the community because I think most folks come into Elixir uh, 
uh, may not be aware of the really interesting computer science problems that like Elixir just gives them for free. Um, but it'd be nice if folks can get into that and like read some papers and understand the theoretical uh, part of computer science that le led to Elixir's development. The second thing I would say is, at least for Elixir programmers, is there's a sense in which everyone sort of writes Elixir their own way, right? You know, everyone has their own version of Elixir. And I think one of the strengths of the object-oriented programming model uh, is that, you know, there is a there is a way, quote unquote, to write good JavaScript, right? Like we can debate on that back and forth, but there's also a way to write good Java, a way to write good C sharp. And there are books on this, right? In the case of Elixir, there are very few books on like, here's how you write good Elixir, right? Closure is the same in many ways. Like here's how you write good closure that looks good, that's readable, that's easy to maintain over time. You think of books like Fowler's Refactoring, it's hard to find things like that for Elixir. So I hope that in the next few years we see people develop some ideas around well, here's the proper way to write an Elixir function. Here's a proper way to do recursion. It's a proper way to write a module so that it can be refactored over time. Um, those are things that I think we're still pretty early on, but that's my hope that, that we would make more effort in that in that regard. Good answer. I have a question, which is, you mentioned your your friend that's working on the uh, uh, Elm on Elixir, and I was curious which, I've seen a couple. I was curious which one that is. Uh, it's my friend, uh, Kofi. Uh, yeah, okay, Kofi's. Yeah, yeah. A, buddy of mine, a buddy of mine talks to him all the time and, and constantly keeps me updated on what he's doing. So uh, do you mind just telling everybody what it's called? I don't remember. Uh, I don't recall either. We talked okay. about it while we were in Sweden. Uh, you recall the name. I mean, it's, it's very tentative and it's called, you know, it's, it's an implementation of, uh, of Elm on the Beam. Um, I don't think he has a name for it yet, but uh, if you look up uh, HK... Gumps, H K G U M B S. Yeah, so it's 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 literally just called Elm Beam there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's it's still pretty pretty early. Uh, I don't want to speak speak too soon, but um, his talk at, at uh, Code Beam in Stockholm was very interesting because at this point he is uh, has a working implementation of of Elm running on Beam, right? Uh, and he can run, you know, very simple Elm code, and it compiles to to it compiles to the beam and runs on a virtual machine, which I think is incredibly powerful and, and shows great promise. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do some picks. Josh, do you want to start us off with the picks? No. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, do you want to start us off? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, the older you get, the, the less interesting games are, right? Huh. And for me, I used to, <laughs> well, that's for me, right? I'm 41 years old now and and with three kids and it just it's things are constant so the time that you get alone uh, where you actually get to yourself or or just you and your spouse the last thing you want to do is play video games at least for me so that being said i finally found a game that's made for me on the iphone right like mm -hmm. my favorite toilet buddy out there and this game is called um wait for it golf clash it's probably the same people who made the the, the other clash clash of clans or whatever it looks very similar but i love golf golf gives me zen and this is like my toilet zen right it's it's the 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 game that i can just play anywhere i am and just go a quick round and you know it's, it's super easy super fun so if anybody wants to play me um my username is coderberry it's a uh, golf clash um and i promise if i'm in the bathroom i won't tell you there's my, there's my <laughs> How much of my time did you just waste there? Shut up. <laughs> It'll substitute for when we can't make it to the golf course together. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, Josh, do you have some picks for us? Hey, I did, I did find my pick. I had to go back through and, and look at what I, what I read this week. Um, but an article, uh, Building the Google Photos Web UI. And it's just about all of the sort of the issues that go into building a, what is a really fast and, and very responsive in the sense that it, it does stuff quickly, uh, user interface for, you know, digging into what could be terabytes of photos, uh, really, really good discussion of all the sort of trade-offs they make and uh, design considerations and really enjoyable and not, you know, not deep back-end technical. So it was a nice diversion. Awesome. Um, I'm going to jump in here with a couple of picks. Uh, the first pick I have is 
and uh, you know, Eric brought it up. It's golf. Now uh, I have a really old set of golf clubs, right, Eric? Yeah, it's actually kind of sad. Um, but yeah, they're. I, I have my dad's old golf clubs <laughs> from when I was a teenager. So so they're they're twenty plus years old. But uh, anyway, it, golfing just you know, as as Eric pointed out, it's just a nice way to get out and uh, you know, kind of get some mental space. Uh, plus, it doesn't hurt that you're moving. You're up and moving. So um, we went golfing last Friday. And uh, anyway, had a great time. It was a ton of fun. So uh, definitely get out there and uh, give it a try. If you're in Utah, I'm sure Eric or I will be happy to uh, go and, uh, you know, do nine holes with you. That'd be fun. Um, Absolutely. But yeah. So just let us know. But yeah, I- I'm going to pick that. And then... Um, I'm also just going to put this out there because I know that people are starting podcasts. Um, I'm putting together a system to manage my podcast uh, content and sponsorships. And I'm getting to the point now where I kind of need a few people to start using the system so that I can, you know, it, it works for me, but I don't know where my blind spots are as far as, you know, how other people do things or, or what they need. And and, and I, I also get that, you know, when you build the SaaS app, it's not, the silver bullet for everybody. But if you're, if you're starting a podcast or running a podcast and you want to give it a shot, let, let me know. Uh, just email me, check at devchat.tv and uh, we'll see how that all comes together. Um, and then my last pick, uh, next week I'm going to be at Podcast Movement. And I've gone to pod, Podcast Movement uh, for the last few years, except for last year. Um, and this year it's in Philadelphia. And uh, so I'm looking forward to going and seeing some of the sites in Philadelphia, but also... Um, I find that it's a terrific place to meet people who are doing things kind of like what we're doing here at devchat.tv, but also just people who are thinking big and trying to be out there and help people. So um, if if you're going to a conference, take the opportunity to get to know people and find out kind of what their big ideas are, because I guarantee you that's something that you'll benefit from um, just from the energy and uh, inspiration that you get from people. So... I'm going to pick that. And then uh, lastly, I have an anti-pick and that's uh, Amazon Prime Day. I think my wife spent like 500 bucks on Prime Day. So uh, <laughs> it's on sale. <laughs> that's what I kept hearing. Anyway, so uh, I'm poor and it's Amazon's fault. Uh, but yeah, those are my picks. I'm sure Amazon's devastated. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, also, what are your picks? I've got one pick. Uh, it's actually a talk by Rich Hickey. Uh, where he actually walks through with Brian Beckman um, the entirety of sort of the, the core of the airline, uh, the, the closure programming model, right? Um, so, you know, for instance, how, how data structures are implemented, so on and so forth. I think it's a great talk because it introduces some of the basic ideas around how functional languages implement things like arrays, et cetera, uh, in a very, very simple way that uh, I always go back to whenever I want to well, for one, just feel like I'm really not that smart. Um, and for two, understand some of the basic ideas that, you know, underpin the history of functional programming. Awesome. And one last question. If people want to find you online, um, do you have a blog or Twitter account or places like that where people can check out what you're working on? Yeah, you can find me at uh, Twitter, Osagaius, O-S-A-G-A-I-U-S. And that's my GitHub as well. So... All right. Well, that was a fun discussion. Thank you for coming and talking to us. Yeah, thank you very much. That was good chatting with you guys. All right. Well, we'll wrap this one up and we will be back next week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.